Chapter 31 He stopped at Les Herondel and had a glass of red wine before he wandered along the back lane to his rented property. No sooner had he stepped over the threshold than the interior grew hot and dark. She came to him, slipping her arms around his waist. I want us to make love, she said, slowly, to savour and enjoy. Afterwards, he made coffee and he went out onto the terrace. The afternoon sun still beating down, but he noticed the clouds gathering on the far horizon. It will rain this evening, he said. By this evening, you will not care. He did not understand the inference, so he quietly drank his coffee and studied her. She wore sunglasses. Face turned to the sky, her white embroidered top open almost to her breasts. His eyes locked on the thin trickle of perspiration running from her throat down to her cleavage and when he noticed her watching him, he felt the heat rise to his face and he turned away. You're so beautiful, he whispered. She tightened her arms around his neck and kissed him in response. Andrew, you do trust me, don't you? Of course I do. Why'd you ask? I don't know. A feeling. Is something worrying you? No. He placed his other hand over hers. You still have to tell me what became of Richard. The king. He nodded. Don't you know your history, Andrew? Not about Richard the Second, no. I know he helped put down the peasants' revolts, but not much else. I never knew we went to Scotland, for instance. That's because those episodes were not recorded. Plenty of stories of him with Wat Tyler his controlling of the barons, how he asserted his own authority, Henry Bolingbroke wrenching the throne from his grasp. You sound bitter. Bitter? No. Sad, Andrew. Sad he ended his days the way he did, in despair. She brought her hands to his face, her fingers pressing in on either side, making small circles around his temples. I want you to relax. Think of nothing. Allow your mind to drift, Andrew. What is this, another dream? A vision. Close your eyes and surrender to the universe. Lambert obeyed, concentrating on a grey mist forming at the edge of his consciousness. It filled his mind, blurring thoughts. He grew tired, a heaviness descending and the swirling, drifting cloud simply became formless. Through the misty portal to the past, Lambert saw it all. A boiling brook usurped Richard and threw him to the grim, cold loneliness of Pontefract Castle, and of how the king died there, alone and forgotten. Lambert peered into the bottom of his coffee cup, reflecting on what he saw. After many moments he sat back, his voice thick with emotion. He died broken-hearted, alone, miserable and forgotten. He drew in a ragged breath. Oh, a sad end. Yes, she said, her voice distant. I often think of him, the love in his eyes. He adored me. But you were not able to reciprocate that love? No. It is so difficult to meet someone who shares the same frequency. It is a rare thing, but once found transcends time. Richard and I would never have achieved such a union of mind and soul. She smiled, took his hands and squeezed hard. So many of us love but never find love in return. After the hunting accident when we met, naturally I was aware he was a king, but at that moment he was a wounded human being who needed not only help but much, much more. As he loved me and discovered devoir, and what such a man could do for me, Richard demanded my sincere comparison. But comparison is the greatest enemy of love. With such knowledge he turned his heart away from me. At any other time, the situation being different, who knows what might have developed. But we met at the wrong moment, and neither of us had any control over that. Lambert nodded, squeezed his own hand in return, and stood up. We had best make our way to the chateau. I feel we still have much to do. He looked down and saw the empty chair. No doubt she had returned to another life, and Lambert knew, instinctively, her thoughts were on Richard and the dreadful ways life, once so full of promise, simply petered out.